Well, are you thankful for good news when you can get it? Now more than ever, it seems like the news media is interested in bad news more than good news. The top news stories are things about death and sickness, murder, war, political unrest, problems with the economy, a, a dysfunctional supply chain, disasters. And it seems like those good news stories are hard to come by. Of course, we live in a sin-cursed world, and all these things, to some extent, have been taking place throughout the history of humanity. And uh, I don't think we should ignore bad news. In fact, uh, many of these bad reports remind us that this world is not our home, and God has something much better in, in store for us in the new heavens and the new earth, and I look forward to that. However, as Christians, I believe God has good news for us every day here in this world. If we look for it, we can find it. And God wants us to focus on the good news He has for us. He wants us to pray for it, to watch for it, to look for it, to find it, and to focus on those, those good things that God has for us here in this world. He wants us to be encouraged by that and to be thankful for it to encourage one another for it. Um, in fact, that's what Paul does in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, we're beginning a new series in the books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and today we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul wrote this book when he was at Corinth. He, he was on his second missionary journey. I showed this map uh, last time I spoke, two weeks ago, and uh, this is his second missionary journey. It doesn't show everything on the journey, but uh, beginning over here, he, he started down in Antioch of Syria, but uh, he came up here, he passed through Galatia, picked up Timothy over here at Lystra, and uh, goes over here to Troas. This is where he picks up Luke, so it's a, a four-man team at that point. Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy, okay? And that's in Acts 16. They cross over the Aegean Sea, come over here to Philippi, and that's where he meets Lydia. He converts some people there at the river where they're meeting for prayer, uh, has a great time of fellowship with them for several days, uh, casts a demon out of a servant girl and gets in trouble for that one. He gets thrown in jail. Him and Silas are in the jail. They've been beaten unjustly, and they're praising God at night. And then, uh, of course, there's the earthquake, and, and he converts the jailer and the jailer's family. And uh, then the next day they're released, and they, they travel about a, about 100 miles here to Thessalonica between Philippi and, and Thessalonica is about 100 miles. And that starts out uh, our... Um, journey through the books of First and Second Thessalonians as we get to know this, this church at Thessalonica. Uh, he went to the synagogue there, converted some of the Jews and a lot of the God-fearing Greeks, but the synagogue leaders were jealous, so they round up some thugs from the marketplace. They start a riot, and um, Paul and Silas get out of Thessalonica. They come about... 50 miles again, uh, a little bit further west and south of, of Thessalonica to Berea. And they start a church there, convert a lot of people to Christ. But again, and it's, it's not the people at Berea who are jealous this time. Now it's, it's the same characters as before in Thessalonica. They hear about what Paul and Silas are doing 50 miles away in a different town. And they're not going to stand for that. So they come all the way down to Berea and start more problems for Paul and Silas. So at that point, Paul leaves, and uh, they scurry him to the coast where he finds passage to Athens, clear down in Achaia, uh, a long ways away. But he leaves Silas and Timothy up in Macedonia to take care of those new churches at Thessalonica and Berea. Uh, after a while, Paul goes to Corinth, and uh, he's going to be at Corinth for quite a while. Um, that's his, where'd 
my pointer go here? There it is. He's going to be at Corinth for a year and a half, and uh, this is where he writes to... Um, get, get stuck here. Go. This is where he's at here, and it's about 250 miles from Thessalonica to Corinth, and he's going to write a couple letters to the church up here. Um, but while he's down there in Corinth, he meets back up with Silas and Timothy, but he's worried about what's going on in those new churches up in Macedonia. And so he, he sends Timothy back up to Thessalonica, and um, Timothy's there for a while, and then he comes back with a report. And he talks about what happens when uh, he hears from Timothy in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. He says, But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. Uh, he has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. You, you see in this verse how they have developed a close connection with these Christians at Thessalonica. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are all invested in this new church plant. They've, they've all worked with these people, and they've developed close relationships with them, and they long to see them again. And Timothy brings this good news report from this new church in Thessalonica, and, and Paul is just thrilled. It's in response to this news from Timothy that he sits down and he writes this letter. In this first chapter of First Thessalonians, it's Paul's purpose to thank God for this good news he, heard, he hears about uh, the new church plant in Thessalonica. It's also his purpose to encourage these Christians at Thessalonica by sharing with them even more good news. So I love this first chapter because it's packed with good news. And a lot of this good news is applicable to us today. So as we read this chapter, let's look for the good news in this chapter that we can be thankful for. Before we read this chapter, though, let's go to God and ask Him to speak to us through His Word. Let's pray. God, as we open up your word, as we open up this book of 1 Thessalonians and embark on a journey through these letters between Paul and the Christians at Thessalonica, may we be uh, encouraged. Help us to see the good news that you have for us. Help us to be filled with gratitude to you for bringing good news to us. And God, I pray that it would transform us and, and shape us and help us to be sources of joy and good news for the people in our lives. Help us, God, to be uh, uh, refreshing waters to people who are thirsty for good news. Help us to be uh, sources of hope and truth for people who are looking for answers and looking for hope. God, we know we live in a sin-cursed world where people are desperate for good news. God, I pray that as a result of our time in your word today, that we'd be able to satisfy that hunger and bring good news to people. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we don't need to say anything about it. 
For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the word of the Lord. And it's a word of good news for us. So what, what is the good news for which we should be thankful what good news can we thank God for this week? Well, first of all, let's thank God for the work of faith, love, and hope. Let's thank God for the work of faith, love, and hope. Uh, this is not the only time Paul talks about these three character traits. He talks about them often, faith, love, and hope. But he's thinking about these new Christians at Thessalonica, and he's remembering how God was helping them to grow, specifically in these three character traits. And it's encouraging to see growth in ourselves and in the lives of others. And that's what Paul was thankful for. He says, we continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, Silas, Timothy, they all invested their lives in these people. They all had a part in bringing them to Christ and helping them grow in Christ and helping them to develop these character traits. So when they, they heard about how they were continuing to grow in these character traits, it, it, was, it was good news and they were thankful for that. So now as Paul writes this letter, he and Silas and Timothy are, are getting together on a regular basis, probably every day, for prayer meetings. And at the top of their list about, of, of things to pray about were these new Christians at Thessalonica. And, and, and at the top of that list was thanksgiving. You know, they, they weren't focused on their uh, physical needs and their illnesses and their financial Troubles. I'm sure they prayed about those things too, but at the top of the list, was, let's thank God for, for the way they're growing in the Lord, for their faith, their love, and, and their hope. They were remembering these new converts and just the way God was working in their lives. And notice how Paul describes these three character traits of faith, hope, and love. They're not just concepts in the mind. They're not just values in the heart. They are those things, but much more, they are actions. It's the work of faith, hope, and love. These character traits were seen in their actions. He talks about the work produced by their faith, the labor prompted by their love, and their endurance inspired by their hope. These character traits were making a positive and practical difference in their lives. And the people around them could see it in real life. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes about these three character traits, encouraging his readers there at Corinth to focus on these character traits and develop these character traits. And, of course, he underscores love as the greatest. He says, and now these th three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Think about our own lives and our own spiritual goals, our own spiritual growth and progress. Are we growing in faith, hope, and love? Are we looking for opportunities to, to display and to live out faith, hope, and love? Can, can people look at our lives and see the actions, the work of our faith, hope, and love? And when we look at other people, when, when we think about our brothers and sisters in Christ, are we watching for their spiritual growth? And, and when we see it, are we thanking God? for the way our brothers and sisters in Christ are growing in faith, hope, and love. What good news should we thank God for? Let's thank God for the power of the gospel. The gospel is a powerful, life-changing message. Look at what Paul says in verse 5. Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. The gospel, of course, means good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, good news 
a good message. And in the New Testament, the gospel is the good news that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried, he was raised from the dead three days later, and, and he told his disciples after that to spread this good news to all the world, make disciples of all the nations, preach the gospel to all creation. The gospel is a powerful message of hope, forgiveness, and eternal life. The gospel is a life-changing message that brings us freedom from addictive behaviors and, and, and sinful addictions. And the gospel is an inspiring message that gives us purpose and significance in this life. In Romans 1.16, Paul talks about the power of the gospel. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Think about the power of the gospel when Paul came to Thessalonica. He had, he had just been beaten and thrown in jail at Philippi. He goes on this 100-mile trip all the way over to Thessalonica, comes to the synagogue, and he, he reasons with the Jews there. And he, he has some success, he has some converts, but he also gets some strong opposition. But, we, you know, we read about it a couple of weeks ago in Acts 17. I don't remember any supernatural events, any supernatural miracles taking place there at Thessalonica. So what does he mean by the gospel did not come in word only, but also in power. Well, he goes on and, and he talks about his lifestyle. You know how we lived among you for your sake. He reminds them of his deep convictions that they saw being lived out for several weeks. Could it be that the power of the gospel that he's referring to is a godly life, holy living? the Holy Spirit living in him and displaying the character traits of Jesus? I think that's what he's talking about. He goes on in, in other parts of the book referring to the way that he lived several times as an example for them to follow. And he's not patting himself on the back. He's not bragging about how good he was. He's just reminding these new Christians that the gospel is a powerful, life-changing message. It can help us live victorious lives. It can help us develop the character traits of Jesus. When we, when we think about the gospel, when we remember how much God loves us, our, our time at the communion, when we remember what Jesus went through for us, that's powerful. That's life-changing. That motivates us to live for God. What about us? Can people see the power of the gospel changing our lives? The power of the gospel motivates us to be transformed. It can change us from evil to good, from depression to joyfulness, from futility to fulfillment. But are we allowing the gospel to change us? Can people see the power of the gospel transforming us? It's good news, and we should be thankful for the power of the gospel. We should also be thankful for the joy of the Holy Spirit. Thank God every week for the joy of the Holy Spirit. Look at what Paul says in verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. The joy given by the Holy Spirit. You know, this is amazing. When you think about what these new Christians at Thessalonica went through, I mean, right after they're converted, they went through some severe suffering, persecution for their faith. And yet, they welcomed the message with joy. You know, Jesus said that one of the greatest events of joy is when a sinner repents and comes to the Lord. He said there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. These people at Thessalonica were hearing the gospel, receiving it with great joy, welcoming it, even though it meant suffering, even though it meant changing their lives and, and, and encountering rejection and 
ostracized by their own family members. And many of these were, were Jewish people who, when they accepted Jesus as the Messiah, their, their Jewish community and their own family members would reject them and no longer accept them. We see how sincere their conversions were. We see how sincere their repentance was. We see how sincere their joy was. Paul said they became imitators of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. They were joyfully making radical changes in their lives to please Jesus and to follow Jesus, even if it meant being mistreated by the people who were closest to them, their own family members. Think about Jason. Back in Acts 17, we read about Jason, this new Christian at Thessalonica. Here's this angry mob coming through the streets, coming to Jason's house. They hear that Paul and Silas is being uh, quartered there, that Jason is uh, harboring the fugitives there. And they, they bust into Jason's house, tear the place apart, look under the bed, under the counters, and under the table, and in the closet. They're f- trying to find Paul and Silas, so they can't find him. So what do they do? They grab Jason, yank him out of his own house, drag him through the streets, bring him to the city officials. This new Christian just put his faith in Christ a couple of weeks ago. How does Jason handle that? He joyfully accepted a time of suffering. He joyfully accepts. Even, he, he doesn't give up uh, Paul and Silas. He doesn't rat out, oh yeah, they're staying over at this other guy's house. No, he, he just joyfully pays the fine for, for this false charge trumped up against him. How could Jason, a new Christian, be joyful in a situation like that? Well, Paul puts his finger on it. Right here in this passage, he had the joy given by the Holy Spirit. This is a supernatural joy. It's not like happiness. It's not dependent upon the situations we face in life. It transcends what we encounter in this life. Of course, they were joyful about having forgiveness and salvation in Christ. Acts 2.38, though, tells us that when we're baptized into Christ, we receive two awesome gifts from God. We receive forgiveness of sins, but we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives within us to develop the character traits of Christ, one of which is joy. Remember the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are character traits that the Holy Spirit is developing within us. And joy is a character trait. It's not just an emotional response to a situation we're facing in life. This kind of joy is a decision to focus on the eternal blessings that we have in Christ. It helps us to rejoice in the Lord always, as Paul says in Philippians. And the Holy Spirit helps us to do this. The Holy Spirit was living in the life of Jason, helping him to rejoice in the Lord always. And the other Christians there at Thessalonica were also demonstrating that kind of joy. Paul is just amazed by it, and he he loves to use them as an illustration. If we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we see Paul telling the Christians at Corinth about the Christians up north in Macedonia, including the, the church there at Thessalonica. This is what he says in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Paul was bragging about these new Christians at Thessalonica and the joy of the Holy Spirit and what that was doing in their lives. Even in a time of severe trial and extreme poverty, it was welling up into joy and generosity. I've noticed that joyful people are generous people. Have you noticed that? Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's generous people are joyful. And maybe it's, it's, a, it's a, a cycle of blessing. As you're joyful, you give, and as you give, you're more joyful. But it's really the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
gives us so much to be joyful about. I mean, he's our comforter. He's our encourager. And he's there. He comes alongside us in, in difficult times. He helps us to pray. And he's there to help us grow in our faith. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee of of being children of God, our guarantee that we are saved and we have eternal life. And he helps us to live a victorious life. How can we not be joyful with all these blessings we have from the Holy Spirit? How can we not be joyful when we think about heaven and forgiveness and eternal life and having abundant life and living a victorious life? The Holy Spirit brings us joy if we allow him to. We walk in the Spirit and think about all the things that the Holy Spirit is doing for us and meditate on all those blessings we have in Christ, how can we not be joyful? We have much to be thankful for. What good news should we thank God for this week? Let's thank God for opportunities to share our faith. Thank God for opportunities to share our faith. Paul and Timothy, um, they were invested, as well as Silas, invested in this church at Thessalonica. But down in Corinth, they were still concerned about what was going on with those new Christians. So Paul sends Timothy back up to Thessalonica. He says, find out what's going on there. I'm concerned about their faith. I'm hoping that they haven't been tempted to, to leave the church and go back to their old life. And so... Uh, we don't know exactly when Timothy was sent up there, how long he stayed, and when he came back. But by the time he came back with good news, Paul had already been hearing from other people about the church in Thessalonica. They had been preaching and sharing their faith, and it had been, it had been spread throughout all Macedonia and Achaia, and it was coming back all the way down to Corinth, 250 miles south of them, and Paul was hearing about it secondhand through travelers coming through Corinth. Listen to what he says in verse 8. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Can you sense the excitement and the amazement in Paul's voice as, as he hears by word of mouth what's taking place up in Thessalonica? wow, your, your testimony is spreading throughout the whole region. I don't even have to say anything about you. Everyone else is saying it. Everywhere we go, we hear people talking about your conversion to Christ. And that's exciting. You know, when you see lives that are truly changed, when people are sincerely converted to Christ, it, it, it catches people's attention and people start talking about how this person has really changed for the better. And when the word gets out, more and more people want to know how those lives were changed. Why? And, and how they can have that. When they see people uh, joyfully going through trials and suffering, they want to know, what, what's the deal? Why are they so joyful in this difficult time? And it creates opportunities for us to share our faith. We should pray for those opportunities. We should look for those opportunities to live out our faith and to share our faith. Look at what Paul says in Colossians 4. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. I wonder what we're supposed to watch for and what we're supposed to thank God for. Well, maybe we'll find out here. Let's see. And pray for us too that God may open a door. Oh, that's what we're supposed to watch for and pray for and thank God for. That God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. We need to pray for those open doors opportunities to live out the gospel and to share the gospel. If we're sincerely living out our faith in every place, we will have opportunities to share our faith. And in our world today, people are desperately looking for good news. When they hear about someone whose life has been changed for the better, they want to know how it happened, and they want to know more. And when someone hears about uh, people going through times of suffering and yet 
handling it with joy and contentment and, and anticipation for good things, hope for the future. They want to know why and how they can have that hope and that joy. Paul was amazed at the testimony of the Thessalonians up in Macedonia, 250 miles north of him, was reaching him all the way down in Corinth. And the reason was that these Thessalonians were the real deal. They were authentic. They were genuine in their faith, and they were living out their faith wherever they went. They were truly converted. When people hear the good news, and they hear it from someone who is genuine and authentic, they talk about it. Look at what Paul says in verses 9 and 10. They themselves report... He's talking about the people he's hearing from, these second and third hand people hearing from them about what the Thessalonians went through. They themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from coming wrath. Paul was talking about these people he was meeting. Maybe he was in the Agora, the marketplace at Corinth, doing some tent work, and travelers coming through are talking to him, and he's telling them that he's a Christian, he believes in Jesus, and and they're saying, oh, you're a Christian. You know, I I know some people who became Christians uh, up in Thessalonica. You ever been to Thessalonica, Paul? Paul said, are you serious? I'm the one that led them to Christ. Really? Yeah, man, they're great. They they have really changed. They are great people. You know Jason? Yeah, I know Jason. I stayed at his house. And he's just amazed at this. That's the way God works, you know? He works through our stories, our testimonies. And and, and the word spreads. And it's amazing how God causes our our testimonies to, to continue to live beyond where where we'd ever think they would go. Word gets out. And we need to look for opportunities and thank God for those opportunities to, to live out our faith and to share our faith. These new Christians at Thessalonica were sincere. They were the real deal. They, they had turned away from their idols and their false gods, and they turned to serve the living and true God. And everyone who knew them could testify that these Thessalonians were truly changed for the better because of Jesus. That's powerful. What about us? What would the people who know you say about your faith? Do they know your story? Do they see positive changes continuing to take place in your life because of Jesus? That's how people describe the Thessalonians. I hope that's how people describe me. I want my testimony to have that kind of power and and that kind of, of effect when people hear about what God is doing in my life. Before I conclude this message, I want to say uh, something else about the last verse of this chapter. The books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians tell us a lot about the return of Christ. So if you want to know more about end times and the return of Christ, don't miss any of the sermons in this series because every chapter says something about the return of Christ, including this one. And we see it here in verse 10. In verse 10, this is the beginning of a common thread that weaves its way through the letters of First and Second Thessalonians. And they tell us information about the return of Christ. In this verse, Paul mentions the good news about the return of Christ. Jesus rescues us from coming wrath, the judgment day. As Christians, we can face the return of Christ and Judgment Day with confidence. Because as Christians, we're looking forward to good things, eternal life, heaven, a a new resurrected body that doesn't have any problems, any sickness, any ailments, any pains. 
We're looking forward to reunions with those who have gone on before us. We're looking forward to the glorious presence of God for all eternity. However, for those who refuse to follow Jesus, to those who reject the message of good news, the gospel, they cannot look forward to the return of Christ with confidence because they're facing bad news. They're facing the wrath of God. Jesus rescues us from coming wrath. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and and the wages of sin is death. Every sin must be punished. And that punishment will ultimately take place on the day of judgment. But the good news is that Jesus rescues us from coming wrath because he went to the cross and he took that punishment for us. And that is an offer of salvation. That is an offer of being rescued from coming wrath. And we accept that offer by putting our faith in Christ, turning away from sin, and being baptized into Christ. When we're baptized into Christ, that's when we're, we're united with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's when those blessings are applied to us. How have you responded to the offer that Jesus makes to rescue you? From coming wrath. That's the good news that we can thank God for every day. And that's the good news that we should share with the people in our lives. Are you thankful for good news? I am. Thank God for good news. We're going to pray and we'll sing one more song before we're dismissed. And as we do that, let's, let's think about all these blessings we have in Christ and how we can be thankful for the good news this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this first chapter in Thessalonians filled with good news, things for which we should be thankful every day. God, we are thankful for the work of faith, love, and hope. God, we're thankful for the life-changing, powerful message of the gospel. God, we're thankful for the joy of the Holy Spirit that you've given to us, that you've poured out into our hearts. God, we are also thankful for opportunities you give us to share our faith with others, and we pray that you'd help us to see those opportunities, give us the courage and the wisdom to know how to respond to every opportunity you give us, help us to be effective as we share this good news with the people in our lives. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.